All right, guys, let's bring it up. Jason, what are you doing in the back there? You do don't you do know we have a QA, right? Uh, now you do, my friend. So, guys, this is how we're going to do this. Um, anybody, you can obviously ask a question to the group, ask the question individual. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, ask a question to the group, ask a question to the individual. For, uh, oh, there's one right here. Here we go. Musical chairs. Show me your agility. Look at this. <laughs> That's how, that's how I live, Jay. I live on the edge, my friend. All right, so when you guys ask questions, if you guys could just repeat the question uh, that was asked, and then, like I said, we'll, we'll pass the mic if necessary. Hey, this, this, is, like, this is the part where, like, please don't hold back because it always happens. Like, ah, I think Max, like, scared everybody from answering questions yesterday and shit. So just, like, ask right on away. All right, three, two, one, let's go. Okay, so the question was, what do you do when you come from an event like this and there's so much stuff that you've learned and feel like you need to do, what do you do when you get overwhelmed? Um, I, I usually just circle, like, for instance, in an event like this, there's something that usually speaks at me. Right? Somebody will say something and it's just like, that's it. I feel it. Like, I feel that that's the thing that I need to take action on. And I circle that shit. I write that shit down. And that's like the main thing I'm going to work on. I mean, it really is that, right? What's the one thing that really speaks to you that somebody said and you're like, man, that, that is the most important thing that I'm feeling that I need to attack. And then don't worry about the rest and then just go and work on that. We're not all going to answer every question. I'll be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> is that good? Okay. Well, I, I would just say the book, The One Thing, has the focusing question, which is every day you wake up, what is the one thing I can do right now so that by doing it and accomplishing that, nothing else matters or is easier. So every day, think of that. A lot is um, one piece that was uncommon advice, but I think helped me out a lot when I feel that way, and I feel that way often, is allowing for an incubation period. I mean, I get that everybody always wants to put something into action the minute they hear it, but some ideas aren't ready to be shipped right off the bat, right? You think of musicians, you think of anybody that does anything artistic. If they put their first rendition out there, uh, I don't know about that. There's a reason rehearsal takes place. And so Susan Cain talks about it in her book, Quiet, which I think was great. She goes, you have, there's a reason we oftentimes think of our best ideas when we're in a warm shower, after we've worked out, after a leisurely walk. An incubation period is, is huge. You have to give your subconscious some time to solve this problem, right? And so... I think we have a fast paced society and it's great to put things into action and to go with it right away. But there's also a lot of shit out there. People put stuff out there before it's ready. They haven't really thought it through. They haven't edited it. They haven't asked people that maybe aren't in their network what they think. I think in like how networked and how fast everything moves right now, we really need to take our time and be more thoughtful about the quality because think of the shelf life. It's not always first to market. It's what's going to last. And, and that still matters today more than ever. And, and just building on that, one of the things I would recommend is I don't know how many of you listen to podcasts and audiobooks and uh, read articles, but you guys just spent like two or three days, depending if you're at the hands-on here, like real deep, immersive learning experience. You don't need to listen to shit or read shit for the next 90 days. Like literally, like every day you got to focus on the one thing. And if you struggle with that, a lot of it is because we're just input overload. So delete all your social media apps. Don't turn on uh, the TV unless it's like a, a Netflix show. So you're not getting commercials. You're not watching the news. You're not seeing other people's news feeds. So you're not distracted by the comparison game or what are they doing? What am I doing? And every day just do, I meditate. I'm a huge meditation fan. I think it's a huge thing that you should implement with your clients, but People get scared of that because they just think of, you know, cross legs and humming and weird noises. 
But you can meditate by going for a 30-minute walk without your phone, going for a swim, going for a ride, like, and create that in your life where you get up and you do that. If you have early clients, like, okay, I get it, but drive in silence to the gym. If you, don't, if you can, ride to the gym, walk to the gym, run to the gym, but you got to create the space. And the subconscious will go to work. The, the, the one thing will come to you, what you need to do, because the reality is, is let's say you do want to open 100 gyms, but you're barely paying your rent in the one. Well, that doesn't matter that you want to open that 100 gym. That goes in the drawer. That's seated. What you got to focus on is to what, what is going to get me to tomorrow, because nothing else exists from this, apart from that present moment. So it's what, what is today's activity? That's it. Outside of that, it doesn't matter. You know, if you have bills, if you have debt, and, and nobody's knocking on your door, it's okay to not worry about that for a day because nobody's knocking on your door, right? And that's what we tend to do. We tend to overload ourselves with what's coming in the future and all of these problems that we have. But if the bills are due on the 15th and it's the first, you got 15 days to take massive action. You know, but we'll get, uh, in today's society, we freeze. You know, you hear fight and flight, but we freeze. And it's because we're just overloaded, overloaded. So really give your body a break from, from the energy and the interaction coming from outside you have a map right in front of you, like at least for 90 days. I would argue probably for the next year, right? And if you struggle implementing, well, just like you tell your clients, go get a coach. But at the end of the day, you don't need more information at this point. Information is not what's lacking. It's, it's okay to do nothing sometimes. I'll just add something real quick. Let's test it. You know, don't go 100% into something because it sounded like a great idea to you at the time. I've had lots of good ideas at the time that turned out to be really shitty ideas once I actually did them. So if you get really excited, the one thing, don't have everybody in the entire gym do it. Try it yourself. Try it with a small group of clients. See if it actually works for you, if it fits within your model. And if it doesn't, then move on. If it does, now look at the bigger picture. But it's easy to go 100% into something than realize you spent three months on something that was not very good for you. Uh, and I take on too much shit, as most of you probably know. No. Yes. <laughs> so it's uh, narrowing things down. I think I think everybody can learn from that. That's always been kind of a bit of my issue. But you know, if you think about like multiple arrows moving in different directions, right? You you bring them into one arrow and you move further, faster. So that's uh, you know. But but when when you say which ones is like there's uh there's projects I just need to go like eh. Fuck that. There's two or three things I need to work on and that's it. But ask, I guess ask yourself what that is for you. Right? What's, what's the most important thing that needs to move forward? Thanks, Nate, for that deep question. Appreciate it. Okay, so what the question is, what do you do to uh, inspire staff, motivate your staff, so that work at a higher level? A lot of my staff is here, so I hope that uh, this is true. <laughs> I mean, I'd say that finding out just, you know, um, just like you sit down with a client, and, you know, you can't really necessarily motivate anybody, right? You can unlock their motivation. Um, is, is finding out what they want and what, what, what has meaning for them. And I, I just think that not enough gym owners... Um, have, a, have deep enough conversations with their team about what they want to achieve and where they want to go. And when it, where is that cross-section of their vision and, and the vision of, of the business, right? So you, if, if I ask you, hey, sit down with a client, you know, you're not going to sit down with a client at the beginning and find out as much about them as possible, dig deep about why they're here, you know, why, why are they really here, where they want to go, what matters to them, you know, what's the gap, You'd be like, that's, that's crazy. I can't really help them out and find the, the problems and the path to help them that way. But I, I see so many people not really doing that with, with their team and just having those, those conversations. And do you do it as consistently as you would with the client? 
And and like I said, look, I, you know, I, I could get a lot better at that too, but it's but it's definitely something that's top of mind awareness because the reality is like your team is are the people that help the clients. So you know, I, I call it under the hood. What's what's the culture under the hood? The culture of the team defines the culture of the gym a lot of times. So like make make that something that you do. Period, or periodically with everybody. Yeah, I have uh, many things that I could conceivably say about this. There are two things that immediately jump out. One, I think, is creating systems for ongoing, relentless education in every realm of the business. I'm a believer that an ideal business is what would be called a learning organization and that you need to devote as much time to mindset and broader person involvement as skill set, particularly in any service business, because fundamentally, your client's experience of the business is going to be reflective of the energy exchange they have with your team. So I think like Lucas said, the culture of your business is the culture of your team. The other thing I'd share that is perhaps slightly counterintuitive is creating a culture of constant tension and conflict. Constant tension and conflict and making sure that you are constantly having conversations about the things you disagree with and the less headliney, bully pointed, grab attention version of that is learning how to do that in a way that's constructive, that doesn't feel emotionally combative. Because I think in many work organizations, we unfortunately give up on each other and we stop talking about the things that matter and we have these unsettled resentments and frustrations that never get vetted. And not only can you do that, but if you do do that, you ultimately become closer. And that's actually a skill set you can learn. When I was younger, I sometimes struggled with this because I'm a very nice guy, but I'm very good with conflict. And if I'm upset with you about something, it's going to be hard. I'm going to address it with you very directly. And when I was younger, I didn't really understand why the team didn't do that. I would get my feelings hurt if they didn't tell me, if they were upset with me when I did something. And for a while, I had a story that, oh, you're a coward if you don't talk about things. You're a coward. And then ultimately, I realized different people are different and not everyone is comfortable with conflict. And you can, in fact, learn how to do that. And for anybody that wants to dig into that, I'm a huge fan of the Crucial Conversation series. The book Difficult Conversation is very useful. And once again, this is another area where it's not enough just to have the information. You have to actually practice it. Because I'll tell you what, we had our team read these books and didn't a damn thing change. Nothing changed until we started doing in-services and going through a structured conversation, how you learn how to begin with shared purpose. You learn how to state your facts, the inarguable behaviors. You take responsibility for your own emotions. You volunteer the meaning you're ascribing to their behavior. You learn how to deeply listen, reflect back what the other person is saying. Because it is a technique. You can learn how to do it. And I am a believer, it's sort of cliche, that the quality of your life is directly related to the number of difficult and perhaps the depth of the difficult conversations you have. And I think it's, it's a learnable skill and something that's not talked about enough, I think. So it's, it's funny, I think a society, just like a team, is driven by essentially two or three things. It's culture and consequences and also communication, which is funny. Like you both said culture and communication, so I'm not going to go there. But consequences can be good and bad. So I think it's very important if you want to have a strong and motivated and inspired team that you have a strong incentive structure for them and that you have clear consequences for um, what you don't want to have happen at the gym. And I think that's like uh, pretty important. That's the only thing I would add. You got to understand the people you hire are probably more fucked up than you. Um, and that the, the, at the end of the day, uh, they're not entrepreneurial if they, if they are. They, they probably wouldn't be working for you. Uh, they probably don't have the skill sets you have. They don't have the experience you have. So ultimately, you're either their coach and you have to train them to be, like you have to be willing to invest into that person, either your time. And if you don't have the time to be their coach, if you expect them to deliver a service experience to your clients by, you know, hey, I'm this way, you should be this way too, uh, that's the wrong approach. So you have to be willing to invest in them as their coach. And if you don't have the time to do that because, you know, the business isn't big enough and you've got a hundred other hats you're wearing, you need to find them a coach. Ultimately, like wherever they are in their journey, like they're, they're, it's wrong to say it like this, but it's the best way to get my point across is that they're behind you, right? 
And some of you probably worked for other people. Why did you go out on your own? Probably because you didn't feel appreciated. You didn't feel like there was a, a learning, growing experience. Um, and all the research backs that up. Uh, Mark recommended a great book a long time ago. Um, it's, uh, is it what, what Really Motivates People? Oh, sorry. Uh, it's Why Motivating People Doesn't Work and What to Do About It by a very brilliant woman named Susan Fowler. And she essentially has extrapolated from the self-determination theory literature and explicitly how to apply that in a work setting. A lot of great stuff in there. I think these guys all touched on it. But, you know, one thing that people always try to integrate into these kinds of <laughs> conversations is, oh, make sure they're clear on the mission statement, the vision statement. It's all well and good, but sometimes it's valuable to have a pre-mortem. And instead of like always trying to forecast, uh, you know, hey, what are our values? What's our culture? Think if your business failed today, whatever your business is, and then work backwards collaboratively to think, how did that get there? And I had to do that with an organization that I took part of trying to kind of flip its culture around within a very short time frame because people don't think that's real. I think sometimes they have their own issues, fears, insecurities, things like that, but they don't consider what if the mothership goes down? And that's not about a way or, or towards base motivation. It's just that this is a little bit of that dark side in nature where sometimes it's not always about, hey, how can we get on the same page? How can we have this vision or mission statement? Just think, guys, things can go wrong here. Let's act as if they did. What happened here? Was it logistics that caused it to go down the drain? Did we not systematize, like Mark said? Was it communication? And really use kind of those improv strategies to say, our business failed today. Why? And they talk about Amazon did that, right? Amazon and all these companies, they will sit there and say, before this product, whatever this minimally viable product is, let's imagine it went out today and it absolutely failed. What were all the things wrong with it? Because what do people do the majority of the time when you ask for their opinion? They sit there, they nod their head, oh yeah, great product. Yes, we're very innovative. Love being a part of this culture. Sometimes you got to remove the gloss and sheen of something and see things as they really are if you want to make a lasting difference and impact. I just want to add that we do this at Mark Fisher Fitness. And in fact, Pete Dupuy and I, I think, really came into our friendship when he and Tony Gentico were visiting and came upstairs while we were doing a pre-mortem about Bowery. And some of the team was actually crying during this conversation where we played the game of one year from today, we failed. What happened? Very useful exercise. Well, well, for me, um, before this year, I, end of last year, I took a, I was with a company, um, and I've been with companies and then on my own and then with companies. And so this year I transitioned back on my own with the caveat that I would never partner with someone again. And, um, you have to go back to the beginning, right? Like when you have a company and you have a team, we have, I had over 40 people like before. Um, and I'm the kind of person, like if I don't enjoy something, then it's easier for me to just like peace out than to like ruin a friendship or ruin the business. And so uh, I've done it several times, um, but this time it was like, you know, I'm not looking for that next person. So what do I have to do to, to, to build my business? And the reality is, is I'm used to running, uh, you know, uh, last company was, we were over seven figures. The company before that was over eight figures, but now I have a zero sum business, right? And I think that one of the hardest things to do, and this comes back to fitness as well, because, you know, I, I broke the world record, stepped on a body on stage, and then all my, my entire hormone panel is complete crap, right? Um, well, I have to go back to the beginning. Like you are, you have to humble yourself and say, in this situation, what is the first step I need to take? Nothing in the past exists. Nothing in the future exists. It's just right now. And that is sometimes really hard because you get the, well, I'm this and I'm that, and the ego comes to play. And so a lot of the times, like I, and, and, to put in the realms, if you guys, okay, I got a successful offline business, I want to start an online business, like go back to what it was like when you were first starting the offline, uh, the, you know, the, the original business. You, that's the mindset you have to be in. It's not just as easy to go into another, another business or open another location. Uh, and I think that that's probably the biggest challenge is just 
like sometimes it's like, oh, I don't have that person to do that. I don't have the resources anymore um, because I'm starting from scratch again. So it's a, uh, you know, that's the the challenge that has uh, probably made me grow the most this year. I've had kind of a weird challenge. I um, found myself in the unique position of being able to pretty much do anything I wanted to. And I, I hope everybody has that same problem in the future. But when every door is open, it's really hard to figure out which one to open. And you have to, it, it took a lot of time alone, uh, trying to like figure out what was not what was important because, you know, everything's important or nothing is, but figure out what's most important. And I think um, if you can prioritize and execute after that, then that helps quite a bit. But it, it takes time, and that's a hard thing to overcome, really. I'm a big believer in talent needs trauma. And so the first thing you should wipe from your mind is that, you know, issues, failures, any of these things are things that you should avoid, right? And that was kind of the crux of the nature of my presentation as well. Like, people think that anxiety, fear, that all these things are bad emotions – Really, they're Mark Fisher fucking superpowers that let you know you care about something and they're adaptive. Absolutely. Like every trait you have is an adaptive trait. And that's not like jargon, guys. That's real. We feel these things. Emotions drives all these things. They're telltale sensors that, you know, something is either right or wrong. Or maybe it's time for you to jump. Uh, the struggles I've had in the past couple of years, well, I left a company I was with for six years that I loved dearly. Right. But it was time for a, a new routine. I got married. Uh, I wrote a book and I took on a business partner that we weren't really a great fit, right? So then I moved my wife, we've been married about a year and a half, across the country to start a new venture. There's a lot of risks there, right? But I mean it, talent needs trauma and it's also stretched me more than I ever thought I'd be stretched. I like strength and conditioning, I got enough. I think I was telling some friends over lunch, I remember the day I signed up for an Instagram account. For strength coaches, that's not cool. That, that sent the message that I'm not coaching 18 hours a day and doing all this stuff. When really I was just trying to find a medium where I could share advice that I wish other people would have shared from, with me. Because I never had a direct mentor. Everybody's a situational mentor, right? Like I'm not ignorant enough to think, oh, I didn't really have any mentors. But I never had a direct mentor. So like my voice has always been one. That, people talk about finding a brand. Screw building a brand. Find your voice. And I had to decide what mine was going to be and stick with that no matter what anybody thought about it. Because you're always going to have people that are going to be detractors or say X, Y, and Z, just remember this, dogs always bark at what they don't understand, right? As long as you're true to a mission, a vision, and you have your values set, welcome any of those challenges, welcome the calluses, welcome the scars, just make them transformational for other people and really mentor, because that's something that's really missing in our field today. We have more clinics and conferences than ever before, more information as you alluded to, but there's not a lot of people out there really mentoring people. That's a huge piece. All right, what, what you got on me? See if I can stick to this. 60 seconds. Shit. All right. Uh, I would just say that, you know, when you do things, um, like big actions, right? You take, for, for me, obviously, this year was getting the building, buying the building, and doing the whole construction thing. Um, you're always going to get tested on your commitment, right? You're like, all right, I'm going to do this, right? And then you think that once you make the decision, everything's going to be kind of smooth, and then there's just a million fuck-ups. Um, and I, w I would just say that, like, you know, if, if you're truly committed to the big thing, just know there's going to be struggle. And you just, ref you know, it's like, this, this is the process that I really like. Learn, apply, reflect, and course correct. There's the, those are the four things that I just always tell myself. Learn, apply, reflect, course correct, right? And, and um, you know, stuff keeps coming up. Just because you want it to be better or you're like, hey, well, 17 things went wrong, so now everything should be okay. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, right? You're, you're just going to keep dealing with stuff. And that's normal. You know, like, you accept that. It's, it's kind of like replaying your fear in your head. Like, what's the worst that could happen? Which is kind of the same answer as some of these guys said, right? Like, replay what's the worst that could happen. Can you live with it? Cool. Then, then move forward with action. Um, I, I reread this twice uh, this year, Resilience by Eric Greitens, um, fantastic book. Just uh, put it this way, a, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of great points and stories on how to overcome struggle.
the one thing because I have ADD and like Max said, I have a lot of opportunities. Uh, Jay Kelleher and something, what's the guy, Papasan? Uh, or I, I don't remember. You'll figure it out. <laughs> Open Amazon app, man. It's a great, great place. The one thing. <clears throat> hey, guys, as an avid reader, and, uh, you know, I consider myself, Luca knows, a real uh, book of file where I just, I'm nonstop reading books. Guys, I see people writing stuff down. What I would give you the advice is a book is an investment in your time. And a hard answer is, I don't know what books you've read or which ones you haven't or where you're at, where I could tell you a book right now, and it's absolutely the best book or the worst book, and it could be the same book. But, uh, but so what I would do is I would say, guys, definitely take it with a grain of salt and do your research on which one you need or what you get. You're going to hear a lot of them, but if you buy 20 books right now, you're probably not going to read those 20 books over a long period of time. But there, but there is the book that exists that exists for the person right now. And uh, so the one that I just read that uh, I really enjoyed, it's called The Captain's Class or just Captain Class by a guy. I think it, I, man, I can't remember the name. I think the last name is Walker. But it was a study of the most successful uh, teams in history and the leadership that went behind it. And I won't spoil the surprise, but what the guy found was like exactly not what the guy expected to find. And, uh, and that taught me a lot in leadership because of what I'm trying to do with my organization and, and building teams in that too. But again, if leadership is not interesting to you or that's not where you're at right now, then guys, I would suggest maybe that's not the book right now. You know what, maybe it's a book on the philosophy of marketing or, or some, some weakness that you really discovered here, I would prefer that you go look that topic up and find that book versus, uh, you know, because I'm on book number 1800. If you're on book number two, it's not time for that book yet. Right? Yeah, that's actually what I meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have ADD, get that book. <laughs> Which, hey, that book's a good book. That he wrote. So I'm going to give you a really backwards answer. The book in front of you. Um, and, and the reason being is it's a fiction book, and I've never written fiction before in my entire life. I write nonfiction, well, every day for 11 years. And so it forced me to look at solving problems through a completely different lens. And, you know, as an avid reader it, it, as well, I mean, there are a lot of books that contributed to where I'm trying to go and who I'm trying to be. But... Anything that challenges you to look at you, your business, your life through a different lens, I, I think is really valuable. So that, from a different angle, was uh, kind of what happened for me with this. I'll just give you a book that I always have clients read, and I think it's important really for any trainer or coach to read, but it's called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky, just because it's very important that when you work with your clients, they understand that the hour they spend with you is nothing compared to the 23 hours they spend on their own. And if they can start to understand the impact of stress in their daily lives and how that plays into their health and their fitness, and they can make that connection, it makes your job a whole lot easier. And it's just a great book to help you also understand how these pieces all fit together. So uh, why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, Robert Polsky, great book. If you don't want to read it, he's got an online um, iTunes University course. You can go through his whole Stanford semester course called uh, Human Behavioral Biology. Watch it. It's fantastic. This is an impossible question. I will give you a couple real quick, but I won't give you whys, and you can look it up and see if you like it. For me, man's search for meaning was very important. Sapiens was very important. The Moral Animal, I found to be a very important book. Uh, leadership and Self-Deception, and I'd throw in Crucial Conversations. I also, somewhere on my Facebook page, and I can try to repost it, I once went through, I, I read a lot of books and I was like, played the game of what would be the only 10 books I'd have someone read and then what would be the next 10? Like if a 21 year old had never read a book and was wondering how to live a successful and ethical life as a human being. And I could, if you want to connect base uh, after, I could share that with you. Mastery by Robert Greene. Uh, simply because I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of studying history, right? Like I think everybody thinks everything there's, always something new and really we're just relearning the same lessons and different life stories. So understanding how some of the world's best and history's best really found their course, how they needed to adapt over time. And Robert writes in a really, really unique, realistic, non sing songy type of way. So Mastery by Robert Greene. It's the number one book I recommend to anybody that asks that question, what book should I read? I think a common theme that we're hearing over and over again on this panel is that we need to do less 
and we need to concentrate on the one thing, or we need to get better at the things that we already know. We don't need to go a mile wide. We need to go a mile deep, and then we need to go an inch over at a time. So anytime that you are seeking out information, make sure that it is the quality information that you're after. Make sure that they're qualified people that are actually giving expert opinion or data on. But for me specifically, a book that helped me out in the last two or three years uh, from moving from full-time coaching to a split between coaching and content development and education was Made to Stick. Because my message with my athletes, it was always a tough conversation because I'm the guy at the end of the line that says we need to fucking change or you're not going to be able to do what you want to do anymore or you're not going to be able to make a livelihood for your kids. And it's not an easy position to be in. Injury is one of the most game-changing things that could happen to your life, and it's pronounced physically. So it's something that my message had to be on point almost from day one, from second one to conversation one when we are bringing in new athletes on the intake process because the buy-in factor on that split second of a yes or no, it made or break the person in front of us in terms of the results that we could drive from them. So that would be my one but again, guys, it's, I think I heard this from Jay on his podcast. I think uh, we need to do less reading across the board, and we need to figure out the one thing that we need, and we need to master things instead of having the curse of superficial knowledge. We get a lot of information thrown at us on social media, in the news, day-to-day uh, -day in the gym. We need to figure out what we're going to be great at and truly go down the rabbit hole on one thing at a time so we can master it and then move on again an inch left or right. I am not going to recommend you read any books. A, because there were also some great uh, recommendations already, including my first and second and third choices. Um, but, but I would say take like a 30-day hiatus from reading anything. Like you, you don't actually live in the world when you're buried in books. And I would give you one more word of advice, at least you know, this has been my experience, um, you know, associating with people like Mark, who's reading audiobooks at like 50 times speed, like seven books per day. I, I, got, I got caught in that race. Like, and, and that's been a recurring theme for me. I've gotten caught in these races for more. Like I was like racing, oh, you got to retire before 30 or you're not good. You know, you got to read four books a week. Oh, now he's reading seven books a week. You got to read seven books a week. And you know, it's, don't, don't get caught in the race. Don't compare yourself to everyone else with how many books they're reading. I would recommend you read if you like reading. You know, And I think you can gain a lot more from a good conversation with someone who really knows what they're talking about. I mean, think about how much you guys learned already. And now, you know, maybe some of you have already written down like five more book recommendations. And you know, over time, yeah, read those for sure. But like, take 30 days off. Don't read anything. Just like really focus on what you know and write yourself some notes and kind of like distill it all down. You know, I think um, it's very important to collate and organize the information that you already have far more than going and seeking out more information. I feel it feels stupid to recommend a book after that. <laughs> and after what I said earlier about not doing anything for 90 days, but um, Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. Um, I'm sure most of you read Think and Grow Rich. Outwitting the Devil is way better. Um, if you just have to get over that it's a conversation with the devil, but it's a phenomenal book. And then uh, The Surrender Experiment uh, has been one of my favorites this year. Um, but as these guys said, and Martin really touched on it, it really depends on where you're at right now. And there'll, there'll be times where I'll do an audio book a day. There'll be times where I do no audio and just read, uh, where I go deep on a topic, where I don't do anything. So if any of you do have like a specific area that you're interested in, uh, I would so, you know feel free to reach out. Mark puts out his list quite often. Um, and there's other people out there like Ryan Holiday who actually has a really great book, Preneur or Seller, uh, which is a phenomenal book about just being like a lasting business and, and thinking about long-term results. But there's guys out there who put lists out there that are pretty relevant and pretty good. But um, usually what you'll find is the, the book you most need will crop up. You know, Someone will recommend it somewhere, you'll see it, or if you go to the bookstore, it will be there. So uh, I really like what Martin said about it's really about where you're at and what you need. So reading to read is, is pointless. Um, it's not a race, um, and you really should try to extract as much information from every book as you can. Um, and sometimes you don't feel like you have to read a whole book. 
That's one of the big mistakes I made in the beginning. A lot of times you can just skip through it and you get the whole concept right away. You know, there's a lot of books now, the title gives the entire book away. Um, and so you're like, you, you read like one story and then you notice the second story just is the same thing. Just move on, you know? Um, or if you just like to read, just keep reading. So, yeah. At the back. His question was, how do you raise your prices and not upset your long-term clients, correct? You, you can't please everybody. Uh, I, I, it, you know, it's interesting. This is related to it, and I'll keep this a super fast story. But basically, at Mark Fisher Fitness, when we opened, we told everyone we were never going to raise the prices so long as you didn't leave your membership. So it was like a rent stabilization model. I liked it. I'm a very loyal person. It felt right. The only challenge was I didn't really know what the fuck I was doing when we opened. So I really fucked up on those prices. And the second year, we actually made them cheaper. Like, I don't know what the fuck we were doing. And then, unfortunately, everything keeps getting more expensive. And, you know, in our model, we had a bunch of different pricing options. So sometimes people wanted to downgrade, but that was actually more expensive. So they stayed in a membership that wasn't right for their goals anymore. Blah, 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 blah. So long story short, we finally got to the place last summer. We ripped off the Band-Aid. And there were two things I think we found useful. Number one, we delayed the pain. We gave them a heads up, like, we're going to do this in January. January of this coming year. And number two, we ate, you know, forgive me, ate the proverbial bag of dicks. And I just like fully like mea culpa. I was like, I fucked up. I'm sorry. I said I would do this thing. I'm feeling a real tension because this is a betrayal of what feels like my integrity, but I don't really have a choice because there were just things I did not know. And I'm terribly, terribly sorry. So what I'm going to do is for those of you that see X amount of increase, we gave them a coupon for their first year. So for some of them, they're not going to see it for a while. Now, that's pretty extreme as far as how to address that kind of thing. But for me, the thing I sort of learned from that was if you were just painfully transparent about what was going on, we didn't really have a ton of pushback. There were a couple of people that were upset, but people at least got it. They realized, like, I'm not a jerk. I just was a fucking idiot. <laughs> how many people are we talking about? I mean... That's a fabulous answer, what, what you just received. I, I think that if you have the luxury of having that conversation with people individually, it becomes even better, right? I mean, if you want some grace with people, treat them like people, not like a transaction. Those two together, thumbs up. Next. Follow me. I, I don't have the pageantry of Mark, but I'm being honest. Everybody, please take out your cell phone. I swear, I'm being honest. This isn't a trick. This isn't something. That's, I'm going to tell you this thing. Right now, where you would type in somebody's phone number to text them, type 444-999. Okay? Everybody with me? That gives a shit at least? In the blank, type my name. Just B-R-E-T-T. -T, and hit send. Give it a second. So all of you, and I promise this wasn't a trick, just inadvertently signed up for my mailing list. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is, this is a real answer. I mean, like I, but I'm telling you, coming out of strength and conditioning, and Andy, I talked to you about this a lot. This idea of scaling was not accepted. It wasn't. Like, again, having social media and, 
And anybody that's, you know, you know this, you guys have advised strength and conditioning coaches, Martin, you know the industry and how like the collegiate side can be, which I was in. Any kind of presence, any kind of scaling, any kind of marketing, any kind of voice puts you into this guru category that people automatically don't like, right? And they say that you're a sellout, you're a fraud. I had to have a lot of people that I really thought uh, highly of and respected tell me, dude, stop worrying so much and spread your message. Especially because I don't write much. Anybody on my mailing list has maybe received three messages. Hey, I got a book coming out. Hey, the book came out. I'd really like your feedback. And that, so I just learned, okay, I can scale and still do that my own way. So I think sometimes you really have to go against, I know people say go against the grain. It's scary as shit because you feel like you're going to be disowned by your core demographic. I'll always resonate first with being a strength and conditioning coach. So marketing in any way, shape or form isn't comfortable for me. But when I had enough friends tell me, you're putting value out there, it's wrong if you don't spread it. And then I wanted to find ways that weren't intrusive, right? Hey, go to my website, click on this, do that, watch this, do that. I'm just like, all right, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to make it really easy for people. I'm going to make it their choice. I didn't give you that during the presentation because I thought Steve was going to kick my ass because he had just talked about the cell phone thing, right? But that was it. I just had a fear of scaling. I'm still uncomfortable with it. I'm working through that because I'm really uh, conscious of what I put out, pun intended. Yeah, so I'm just, right, right. <laughs> I never had one. Somebody goes, oh, I have a bigger list than you. I'm like, I'm at zero. We'll, we'll just do one more. We're running out of time. We'll do one more question. There's a cab in the back. I've sent a daily newsletter for 11 years without missing a day. So that's a lot, I guess. But, I mean, I just kind of show up and feel like I'm writing a note to a friend and that note happens to go to, like, 40,000 friends. So, Yeah, I guess I, echoing that, it would be uh, consistency. So at lunch, maybe you guys went to lunch. I went and trained, you know, uh, tonight. I will continue to read and study and develop myself so uh, that you don't become obsolete, I guess, if we're saying that's what relevancy is. And, and I guess the ultimate challenge for everybody is uh, the word could be upgrading, right? So, hey, how many people when you're on your computer when it says, hey, upgrade now or do you want to upgrade? What do you usually hit? You hit later, right? And if there was an upgrade never button, you would probably hit that. And uh, the challenge is, I guess, if you want to stay relevant in the industry, is you have to continue to upgrade all the time because everything is always changing. But, uh, but at the same time, I don't know what else you would want to do. Because, And last bit, so what happens if you continue to not upgrade, say, your computer or your phone long enough? What happens? It doesn't work anymore, right? Obsolete, dinosaur, whatever it is. So, so that would be the thing. The same deal is just, man, stay consistent. Whatever was working for you, stick to it, right? That, from the emails you send out to the food you put in the hole under your nose to your workout to getting eight hours of sleep. Like, that has been the secret, actually. Yeah, I mean, there's not much I can add to that, but he and I and Joe DeFranco and Alan Cosgrove met for the first time in 1996 in a room with 50 other trainers and probably 44 of them, or 46, I'm not good at math, are not doing anything now. We just did shit consistently over time over and over again and kept doing it even when things were failing. So that's the thing, like it's easy to pick your one thing on Monday that you're gonna do, but like AJ said, stick with it for 90 days. Cause like if you decide, okay, my one thing's a podcast, I'm gonna start Monday, you're not gonna have 10,000 downloads for about two years. So the people that can stick with something and continually do it when it sucks and only three people are reading and only five people are coming to the gym, but can do it for 10, 20 years, those are the people that are gonna win in the end and the reality is probably only seven people in this room will do that. Now, that's not a Jedi mind trick. That's the truth. But you guys got to choose to be those seven people. Ooh. <laughs> Take that in. All right, I'll, I'll do this shit all day right now. But we got we to gotta get going. 